One swallow does not make a summer, but one skiing of geese, cleaving the murk of a March thaw, is the spring. A cardinal whistling spring to a thaw, but later finding himself mistaken, can retrieve his error by resuming his winter silence. A chipmunk, emerging for a sun bath but finding a blizzard, has only to go back to bed. But a migrating goose, skating 200 miles of black night on the chance of finding a hole in the lake, has no easy chance for retreat. His arrival carries the conviction of a prophet who has burned his bridges. A March morning is only as drab as he who walks in it without a glance skyward, ear cocked for geese. I once knew an educated lady, banded by Phi Beta Kappa. <laughs> yeah. Hi. 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 <coughs> She had never heard or seen the geese that twice a year proclaimed the revolving seasons to her well insulated room. <laughs> Is education possibly a process of trading awareness for things of lesser worth? <laughs> the goose who trades his is soon a pile of feathers. The geese that proclaim the seasons to our farm are aware of many things, including the Wisconsin statutes. The southbound November flocks pass over us high and haughty, with scarcely a honk of recognition for their favorite sandbars and sloughs. As a crow flies, is crooked compared with their undevi undeviating aim at the nearest big lake 20 miles to the south, where they loaf by the day on broad waters and filch corn by night from the freshly cut stubbles. November geese are aware that every marsh and pond bristles from dawn till dusk with hopeful guns. March geese are a different story. Although they have been shot at most of the winter, as attested by their buckshot battered pinions, they know that the spring truce is now in effect. They wind the oxbows of the river, cutting low over the now gunless points and islands, and gabbling to each sandbar as to a long lost friend. They weave low over the marshes and meadows, greeting each new melted puddle, puddle and pool. Finally, after a few pro forma circlings of our marsh, they set wing and glide silently to the pond. Black landing gear lowered and rumps white against the far hill. Once touching water, our newly arrived guests set up a honking and splashing that shakes the last thought of winter out of the brittle cattails. Our geese are home again. It is at this moment of each year that I wish I were a muskrat, eye deep in the marsh. Once the first geese are in, they honk a clamorous invitation to each migrating flock, and in a few days the marsh is full of them. On our farm, we measure the amplitude of our spring by two yardsticks, the number of pines planted and the number of geese that stop. Our record is 642 geese, counted in on 11th of April, 1946. As in fall, our spring geese make daily trips to corn, but these are no surreptitious. Sure. Sneaking's out by night. 
The flocks move noisily to and from corn stubbles through the day. Each departure is preceded by a loud gustery debate, and each return by an even louder one. The returning flocks, once thoroughly at home, omit their pro forma circlings of the marsh. They rumble out of the sky like maple leaves, side slipping left and right to lose altitude. Feet sprattled toward the shouts of welcome below. I suppose the ensuing gabble deals with the merits of the day's dinner. They are now eating the waste corn that the snow blanket has protected over winter, from corn-seeking crows, cottontails, meadow mice, and pheasants. It is a conspicuous fact that the corn stubbles selected by geese for feeding are usually those occupying former prairies. No man knows whether this bias for prairie corn reflects some superior nutritional value or some ancestral tradition transmitted from generation to generation since the prairie days. Perhaps it reflects the simpler fact that the prairie cornfields tend to be large. If I could understand the thunderous debates that precede and follow these daily excursions to corn, I might soon learn the reason for the prairie bias. But I cannot, and I am well content that it should remain a mystery. What a dull world if we knew all about geese. And thus watching the daily routine of a spring goose convention, one notices the prevalence of singles, lone geese that do much flying about and much talking. One is apt to impute a disconsolate tone to their honkings, and to jump to the conclusion that they are broken-hearted widowers or mothers hunting lost children. The seasoned ornithologist knows, however, that such subjective interpretation of bird behavior is risky. I long tried to keep an open mind on the question. After my students and I accounted for half a dozen years, the number of geese comprising a flock, some unexpected light was cast on the meaning of lone geese. It was found by mathemat mathematical analysis that flocks of six or multiples of six were far more frequent than chance alone would dictate. In other words, goose flocks are families, or aggregations of families and lone geese in spring are probably just what our fond imaginings had first suggested. They are bereaved survivors of the winter shooting, searching in vain for their kin. Now I am free to grieve with and for the lone honkers. Picture. <laughs> <laughs> it is not often that cold potato mathematics thus confirms the sentimental promptings of the bird lover. On April nights, when it has become warm enough to sit outdoors, we love to listen to the proceedings of the convention in the marsh. There are long periods of silence when one only hears the winnowing of a snipe, the hoot of a distant owl, or the nasal clucking of some amorous coot. Then, of a sudden, a strident honk resounds, and in an instant, pandemoni pandemoni pandemonium echoes. There is a beating of pinions on the water, a rushing of dark prows propelled by churning paddles, and a general shouting by the onlookers of a vehement controversy. Finally, some deep, deep honker has had his last word, and the noise subsides to that half-audible small talk that seldom ceases among geese. Once again, I would I were muskrat. By the time the pasks are in full bloom, our goose convention dwindles, and before May, our marsh is once again a mere grassy wetness, enlivened only by red wings and rails. Yeah, that's it. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the key story. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> what a way to end the trip. Mm -hmm. I was looking on to the left and how like that light kind of just diffuses across all of it. Yeah. That mm -hmm. looks so cool. And it looks, the mountains look like purple. Yeah. It's so pretty. I, w I was like debating to bring my camera and I wish I would have. But. These Alas. moments will be trapped in my memories. I can't trust that. So. Until I have dementia. <laughs> the camera comes out. Dementia. Can I have a memory? Yeah.
pendapat Nepo. Pendapat <laughs> Nepo. Yeah. Nepo. Yeah. Nepo. Like Coco. Just one more. Coco with the Nepo. Coco with the Kamila with the Nepo. Can't see in the bush.